Welcome back to the morning commute. We are here in lovely... Actually, I have no idea where we are. We're on 202. Some nice like mansions we pass, but nice little kind of park, uh, biking area. Anyway, um, I wanted to talk to you about the end of the movie, uh, if, well, close to the end, how to work as a no-budget filmmaker with what you have to, to tell the story you want to tell is, um, is what we're all uh, thinking about and, and striving for. So you, you, to a certain extent, I don't know, I think creativity can expand when you put limits on yourself. So to a certain extent, I had to write a script that I could shoot with just me and my wife Karen and maybe a couple of friends, although because it was such a couple hours here, a couple hours there, because we're busy and, and have really hectic work and personal lives, it almost needed to be just Karen and me because there would never be a time we would plan to have another friend come in. We did the one scene with our friend Brooke, who was the psychiatrist, um, Dr. Sarah Hutchins, which was awesome to have two people that I could direct and I wasn't one of them. That was great and it's such a fabulous scene. But basically, you know, we had the constraints of writing a story and a script that was just shootable with me and Karen. Um, that's a big limit, but you can work so creatively within those limits in that box, that circle that you set up for yourself. So one of the examples was, one of the very first scenes I saw in my head was the end, actually, and um, I think I can talk about it without giving it away if you haven't seen the movie yet, but um, I wrote it originally different, so here it's not going to be a giveaway because this is not how it actually ends. Um, it, it, it calls for police officers um, coming to the house after tragedy happens, and um, I still use police officers in in the, the final edit of the movie, um, but it's slightly different than what I'm going to say, so I won't give anything away. I, I Originally, I had um, Frida becoming possessed at the end as the police officers are coming, and the police officers, you hear the sirens and see the lights and they break down the door because someone had called the police because of the commotion in the house. And Frida is upstairs possessed and you see the officers bust down the door and then Frida's at the top of the stairs and she just jumps slash flies down the stairs onto the one cop and bites his neck out and spits out a huge chunk of flesh, you know, and starts gnawing at his, his, at his neck. Well, originally I'm like picturing, uh, it would be so much fun to have my friend John, who mastered the sound, play one of these cops, um, and perhaps some other people, but um, we, you know, that, that, that's a lot of planning, that's a lot of special effects, that's police uniforms, and it just seemed too much. So the way I creatively, you know, worked within my limits and not being able to do all that without extensive planning and some money was I just use sound and the hints of images. So I use police siren sounds coming, getting louder, so you know they're coming from outside the house. And then I have all this great police light footage from my first mo movie, my feature documentary, Broken on All Sides, which is about, you know, uh, racism in the criminal justice system and the crisis of mass incarceration in the country. So part of it is talking about police, over-policing, brutality, and I have footage of cops and police cars and police lights and sirens, and I have all this great, um, 
abstract images with uh, the police lights, red and blue, really out of focus so that they're just huge blurs of blue and red and they kind of cover the whole screen. And so what I was able to do was overlay that on top of the interiors of the house in this um, ending scene, or almost the end, um, to give the illusion that a police car is right outside and the lights are coming in through the windows. Um, I think I even had to do it so that it was only on the ceiling at one point. So, you know, it didn't look like a clear, like slight overlay, but that it was like coming in through the windows onto the ceiling. And that along with the siren sound, and then it cuts to black and you hear some people screaming, you know, like, you know, police officer, low man voice shouting, um, go, go, go. Uh, it gives you the illusion that I wanted that the cops are basically busting in or coming in. So I didn't have cops. I had police lights. I had police siren. I didn't have voices and I could have gotten some guys over to, 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 to be those voices or women over to, to be those voices. But I used one of my favorite films, um, The Wind That Shakes the Barley um, by Ken Loach about the Irish uh, Revolution. Um, and there's a scene where these young Irish comrades are becoming militant and um, it's like the beginning of the IRA and so they are doing hits against either they're either killing collaborators with the British occupiers Irish collaborators with the British occupiers or they're trying to steal their cache of weapons and things and so there's this one scene where they go into a bar where I think it's local Irish cops who are collaborating with the British are, and they're, they're hanging out, and they come in and they assassinate them, they kill them, and they take their weapons. And so there's, there's a scene of them, they kill them, there's all this commotion and screaming, and they're like, we gotta leave, go, go, go! And so I use that clip, that audio, for the cops in my scene. Um, and it's kind of a tribute to, or not a tribute, a, I don't know what you would call it. It's, it's fun that I know, and now you know, that I use this bit of Ken Loach's movie, because I love Ken Loach. I love that story um, of the wind that shakes the barley. And, uh, you know, I stole a little bit of the sound for that. And it works. And it's a... Uh, you know, like a nod to, to that movie, um, even though you'd never know it. Um, so that's one example of a very complicated, extensive, expensive idea that can be done on no budget. In fact, Karen wasn't even in that. Um, very, that, that shot, it, it was me using the camera as her POV, her point of view. So that's yet another way to get away with you're just one person, and but you're trying to... I, I needed her character to be in it. So you watch the movie, you watch the almost ending scene, you know what I'm talking about, and now you know the backstory of it. And I'll try and come back and give some other examples of how more extensive ideas, but extreme limitation leads to some creative problem solving and an output that I think is actually unique and interesting compared to if we had all the money in the world to do whatever the hell we wanted. Signing off, take care. Go to adarksouvenir.com and I am almost to work so I am going to get out of here and drive. Peace.